Danganronpa V3 has the most contentious ending to a game in the series to date, and also one of the most intriguing. As this will be an analysis of the plot and the ending, this video will contain heavy spoilers and should not be watched until you have completed the game. At the end of the last class trial, the remaining students are told that they volunteered to be in this killing game, and their ultimate talents and backstories were completely fabricated by the Game Master, who turns out to be Sumugi Shirogane. Why go through all that trouble? Because Danganronpa has become a massively popular show that people around the world tune into. So popular that the V3 in the title doesn't refer to this being the third game in the series, the V is actually a 5 and this is the 53rd season of the show. Another revelation is that Kibo's inner voice has been the audience of the game giving him input the whole time, and that audience wants hope to prevail. Despite the shock of all these revelations, and the audience's arguments, Shuichi figures out that the only way to win this game is to not play it at all, and he convinces everyone to refuse to vote, even the audience themselves. Thus, the game ends with the audience tuning out and Kibo destroying the entire academy, with himself and all the other students along with him. Until the epilogue where we discover that Maki, Shuichi, and Himiko have survived, and decide to leave the game and go out into the real world, if there is one. Let's talk about the meta-narrative at play here. During this last act of the game, it is heavily implied that the audience of the killing game is not just within the actual story, but with us, the players who are experiencing it. We keep playing Danganronpa to see hope win out at the end, and we enjoy seeing the killing game continue, just like the game straight up says. The epilogue of the game also strongly hints that these characters will not be leaving the game within the story, but in our own minds. We'll carry them with us forever. This ties into the game's motif of truth and lies, and how a fictional game might be a lie, but it inspires truth in the real world. This motif is mirrored in what the character Kokichi does throughout the game. He lies to the point of being an incredibly annoying character at times, but he peppers his lies with enough truth to force the plot forward, and for Shuichi and the others to discover the real truth they were missing all along. This theme of truth and lies echoes throughout every case in the game, and is absolutely pivotal in the first and last cases. In the very first case, everyone had assumed that Kaede couldn't be the killer, including you because you were playing as her, but in the end the tables are turned and it turns out she was the killer after all. Except... she wasn't. At the end of the game, Shuichi discovers that Kaede's plan didn't work, and Sumugi, the game master, had interfered and killed Rantaro herself. Now, many criticize this ending for essentially putting a cap on the games and irreparably breaking the fourth wall, but I actually think that this is not the case at all. Just like Kokichi's lies sprinkled with truth, I believe this meta-narrative is mostly lies with small pieces of truth shining through. Now, let's talk about the potential truths I've worked out in the game, along with my friend Dragnix, who has an awesome channel you should check out. He's got some cool theory videos in the works, and really figured out a big chunk of this himself. Oh, and by the way, there's no real way to confirm these theories without a sequel and or confirmation from the writer, so take it all with a grain of salt. Alright, so with that, let's get right into it. I'd say the biggest hint we are thrown is in a piece of dialogue spoken by the game master Tsumugi herself. She mentions that the game failing is just like the one she is copying, and that she might be the ultimate cause copier criminal, or basically the ultimate copycat criminal. If you take the meta narrative at face value, this just sounds like her lying to you once again, but if you go back and start assembling the pieces, this very much sounds like the actual truth. Junko Inoshima was the ultimate despair, and everything she did was in service to spreading as much despair in the world as she possibly could. Even after her death during the original game, she was able to influence enough people to create the remnants of despair, essentially a cult dedicated to spreading despair just like Junko wanted. The killing game that happened in the first Danganronpa was a major spark that set off a series of cataclysmic wars in the world, so recreating it makes a huge amount of sense. However, with the world enjoying the games, which I believe is a truth in the meta narrative, it is not going to spark that terrible event again. So, they had to come up with a way to create despair and keep it going. Thus, the ultimate survivor idea was born. 
In any scenario, somebody wins the game, and thus hope is manufactured. However, that hope is what they use to create an endless pit of despair. Rantaro is known to have won the last game, and what was his reward? He was inserted back into the very next game to generate even more despair for a new group of people under the guise of winning with hope. Now, I did think about how the game was said to be creating hope in people who watched it, but I think that's a lie. Sure, the world is technically peaceful, but if everyone is getting their kicks watching a group of teenagers murder each other, something has gone very, very wrong. It's more likely that everyone might think they are living with hope, but they are actually living with a pernicious despair, one that everyone doesn't quite perceive is there. In the last trial of the game, we find out that the show has been going on for 53 seasons. Clearly this plan has been working extremely well for quite some time, so what screwed it up this time around? Going back to Tsumbugi talking about how this game is a copy of the original, I think there are two possibilities. She's either actually the ultimate copycat criminal, or she was made to be, just like the others. We never get to see her audition tape, if it exists at all. So I can't answer this definitively, but I can say this. Many of the events in this game closely mirror the first, so close that it can't comfortably be called a coincidence. I'll get back to that thread in a minute, but let's talk about the game's wild card, the robot Kibo. We know from the previous games that ultimates have a lot of influence over regular people. Junko has an entire cult dedicated to her because of this very reason, so what could you do to overcome this problem during a killing game? Kibo is a robot, and while he has advanced AI that is very human-like, he is not going to succumb to many of the things regular humans will. Sure, he has the antenna on his head that allows the audience to subtly guide him along, but it isn't straight up controlling him until the end, and even then it doesn't really work. This makes him the perfect cipher to send into the killing game in order to undermine it. And who would want to do that? The Future Foundation, which is run by the survivors of the original killing game. You ever notice that Kibo looks like a weird cross between Naige and Komaida? I don't think that's an accident. Even the small parts of Kibo's backstory you hear about in the game reminded me of the things Komaida did back in Danganronpa 2. The idea that the Future Foundation and Remnants of Despair are still fighting each other actually comes up during the final class trial. And while it seems like a throwaway line, I think it's far more likely that it's the truth. I believe that Kibo was created by the Future Foundation and somehow inserted into the game and is the actual Project Gopher. Not only do they plan to undermine and thus end the killing game with Kibo, they likely plan to utilize the survivors at the end. The characters left alive at the end are Shuichi, Himiko, and Maki, and I don't believe those are random in the least. In order for this game to mirror the very first so closely, it needed to have a Makoto and a Kyoko. In this game, I believe the Kyoko was Shuichi, a genius detective, and the Makoto was Maki, a close friend to help through the darkest times with. Maki is also the ultimate assassin, who better to fight the remnants with than with her? The first game also had another important element, a twin. Remember how Kaede's twin sister kept getting brought up? Sure, it was all made out to be a red herring to make you think the mastermind was going to be Kaede's sister all along, but I don't think it's an unimportant detail at all. There's two characters in Danganronpa V3 that closely mirror another two in the first Danganronpa. Kaede and Maki are very similar to Mukuro and Junko. Kaede and Junko are two ultimate artists, a pianist and a fashionista respectively, while Mukuro and Maki are two ultimate warriors. Both Kaede and Mukuro were killed due to interference caused by the mastermind directly, something expressly forbidden in the rules, by the way. Both Maki and Mukuro enter the game with fake aliases. Both Mukuro and Kaede are killed with spikes by the mastermind. Another hint may also be in the character designs. Kaede is in pink, while Maki is in red, which are pretty close to each other. I also found Maki's hairpin to be extremely noticeable, in that it looks like a treble clef on its side, which is similar to Kaede's music note barrettes. There's a lot more in there, but I think you've got the idea. If Tsumugi wanted to mimic the first game, just like she said, she would have had to include a set of twins, 
Interestingly, she didn't seem to be too interested in recreating the first game exactly. The crimes are all different, for example. But everything involving Junko has to match. That likely ties into her fanaticism as a remnant of despair. Or does it? There's another important character here, and that's Kokichi. Not only does his constant lying mimic the overall motif of the game, he also attempts to usurp the Mastermind's position near the end of the game, which is the catalyst for the whole thing unraveling, and brings up a lot more questions. Kokichi had likely figured out everything going on long before everyone else, and used his unique skill of burying truths in a mountain of lies to lead everyone else to the answers as well. But how much did he really know? Did he only know about the Mastermind's plans, or did he figure out a hell of a lot more than that? There's also a question as to who he really is. His meddling leads directly to the game failing in the end, but that also lines up with the goal of getting the game to mimic the first one. Is he a remnant of despair? Maybe he was working with the Future Foundation to undermine the game, and the mimicry was in their best interests as it breaks the cycle of despair. Perhaps he really was just a part of DICE and wanted to screw the games up as a prank. Everything up until this point has built up a case that somebody got the ultimate copycat criminal in as the Game Master on purpose, in order to have her bring the whole thing down by copying the first game. But it's impossible to know who that was. There are other loose ends that I can't tie up myself in here as well. Were the ultimates completely fictional, as Sumugi stated, or were they for real? Sure, the audition tapes make it seem like they were just normal kids, but they might have actually erased their memories because of the ultimate hunt, just like the game shows, which makes the audition tapes potentially questionable. Can you really use tricks to manufacture fake ultimates? The question of the ultimates being fictional or not also calls into question how legitimate Sumugi herself is. Made up or real, her being charged of the game loops right back into questioning who set this entire thing up. Himiko is another unknown. Shuichi and Maki surviving makes sense, but what use is Himiko? She could just be a random choice, but Dragnix has a theory that the rumored UDG2 will be about Himiko, and that she does have some kind of magic in her that can turn the tide in the battle between hope and despair. Only some kind of sequel will fill us in on that one. There's another weird scene in the game that shows up much like Shuichi's other missing memories. It's of a kid named Makoto that talks about how he's just a regular old boring student, but he loves watching Danganronpa. He even shows up in pictures of the audience near the end of the game. His speech parallels Makoto Naigi from the first Danganronpa, and the leader of Future Foundation so much that it can't be a coincidence. But I don't really know how this piece fits in. Is it just another way the current game is mimicking the first? On the surface, Danganronpa V3 seems to tie up its loose ends and put a lid on the series once and for all. However, I hope that with this video, I was able to show that the game has brought up a hell of a lot more questions than it answered, and this series still has a lot of life left in it. If you have anything to add or anything you disagree with, please let me know in the comments below. Having this kind of narrative in games is rare, and it's fun to speculate with other fans. I hope you enjoyed this video and will subscribe for even more in the future.